Hi, good morning. I'm here with Rabbi Rebecca DeBow, and she'll be sharing with us some of the basic tenets of Judaism and also how to get involved in the Queen County, the local synagogue, or to find out more information. And then also Judaism stance on mental health services. And when you're seeking mental health services, what that could be like, especially in Rabbi DeBow's position, Rabbi Rebecca DeBow, not only is female and a very male dominant spiritual foundation, but also has hearing deficits. She is deaf and practicing pushing forward the spiritual belief system. So good morning, Rebecca. How are you? I'm doing great. And is that okay if I say Rebecca is a Rabbi DeBow? Rabbi? Okay, excellent. Great. Okay, so the question you asked about what are the basic tenets of Judaism? Basically, the three tenets. There is um, the Torah, which is like, this is what we call the Hebrew Bible, which includes the five books of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. That's it. That I will Hebrew Bible. So I intentionally say Hebrew Bible because when we say Bible, there's a notion that yeah. we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. But in Judaism, we only um, class the Old Testament. Oh, okay. So the Old Testament is the five books of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. Okay, so Judaism only recognizes the Old Correct. Testament. Okay. Right. And also, Old Testament is a term defined by the Christian. Because oh. we don't consider it Old Testament, New Testament. It is the Hebrew Bible. Okay, and that makes sense because there's nothing right. that I compared it. It's really right. from the Christianity perspective. Right. So it's the Hebrew Bible, right. which would be, you know, equivalent to our Old Testament. Correct. If, in the Christianity, I shouldn't right. even say our because I haven't necessarily right. identified with the Christianity. It's important for people to understand yeah. that. So that's one tenet. The two other tenets are... A, um, a, belief, a belief system in God. We believe in monotheism, obviously it's in one God. And then the third tenet is what we identified as we are the people of Israel. I'm not referring to the land of Israel or Palestine today, but we are the children of Israel. And as we learn from the Hebrew Bible, that's how we will um, divide. So these three, so the study of the Hebrew Bible, the role of God that plays in our lives, and what it means to the people, the collective community. Now here's where it comes to the differences. So these three are the main foundation tenets of Judaism. Just like in Christianity, I mean, there are so many, I can't even count. count. There are so many ways of how you interpret the Bible and so forth. The same thing in Judaism. We have we have three, actually four main yeah, yeah, yeah. movements, and based on how they interpret the Hebrew Bible or the understanding of God or what defines people, that is how they identify the various movements. So we have the may oppose the Orthodox movement, yes, the conservative movement, the reform movement, and the Reconstructionist movement. It, it doesn't necessarily go in that order. It's not about becoming less religious because for all four, including the reform movement, which is the more liberal um, movement, there still is a, um, a respect to the tradition of the Hebrew Bible. There is still a meaningful relationship with God. And there still is the value of community. But how we define community may be different. Okay. So just for us here in Bloomington Normal, the synagogue that I serve is a part of the reform movement. Okay. So, so the synagogue that, that and I apologize for interrupting you. The synagogue that you serve is a part of the reformist movement. It's not reform, it's, it's the reform. Capital the reform. R -E -F -O -R, the reform movement. Okay, great. And what, what is the synagogue's name? The last the synagogue, what is the name oh, of your synagogue? It's Moses Montefiore Congregation. Moses Montefiore kind of Congregation. Right, which is off Tawanda okay. and Robin Hood Lane. Tawanda and Robin Hood Lane. Yeah, and across from the old post office. Okay, yeah. and so we will have that running as a contact for people when they're watching the video. Absolutely. We'll have that so they yeah. can reach out to you and we'll have your phone yeah. number. So believe it or not, many people that live here, and I've only lived here for seven years, not everybody knows where it is. 
And um, not everybody is aware that this synagogue has been here for over 130 years. Wow. Right. So we've been here. Yeah. We're small, but we're small and mighty. And mighty. That's what we said. Yeah. 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 So we have been blessed with some incredible leaders, lay leaders that really worked hard to maintain a legacy so that this community continues um, for the future. So we are approximately 90 families. Okay. And most of these people, there are very few that were born and raised here. And a large number of them are um, because of jobs, especially with the universities and the large corporations here in town. Okay. But the original people that lived here were um, on furniture stores here okay. in town. Uh, they were in the um, what they call the market business. So like the furniture. Furnishing business. Furnishing and business. so their family stayed, yeah. so they carry out the tradition. And a few of them, I think, perhaps came from Chicago or from St. Louis and wanted to enjoy a better quality of life out here. So that's the brief history of this synagogue. So we call it MMT for short. Moses Montefiore, a congregation, but we say Moses Montefiore temple, we go back and forth, but okay. it's MMT. Okay. So I am the spiritual leader and I'm really the only um, employee of the synagogue. We, we also have a, um, a religious school during the year. We have about 25 children that come in and okay. we have a program for them on Sunday. We do worship. Our worship, that's another thing. Our worship is Friday evening and Saturday. Oh, our, okay. our Sabbath begins on Friday. Sign going down and it ends on Saturday evening. So we don't, our Sabbath is always on Saturday, not Sunday. Now, what is Sabbath? Sabbath mm -hmm. is in reference, well, we say Shabbat, which is the Hebrew pronunciation, is um, uh, remembering the seventh day of creation. Okay. And the fact that it's supposed to be a day of rest. It's a day we're supposed to unplug from technology, even though most of us are not able to do that. But nowadays, it's just an opportunity here specifically for our community to come together and just um, we have worship, we say prayers and songs. And pre COVID times, we would have what is called an ONIC, which is a reception, okay. a social fellowship um, event. And then we have holidays and we come together for those. We have quite a few. And I'm telling you that starting in the end of August this year, through mid September, end of September, are three holy days um, for this year's community. Okay, so it's so interesting when you say, like, said it, you have the one, the day of rest right. to unplug. Yes. And it's so hard as, you know, human beings in general to unplug. And I know that there could be some psychological forces at play. So what is Judaism's stance on seeking mental health services? Um, we feel very strongly there is a teaching in our tradition that is called um, Hanefesh, which means we have a responsibility to save our lives, to take care of our not only our spiritual well-being, but our physical well-being. So we are we advocate all the time the need. The fact that there will be times in our lives that we need to be able to ask for help, and especially in mental health. And personally, for myself, it's important to recognize that I'm a spiritual leader and I'm not a therapist. So in, I may encounter situations where I'm meeting with someone who's very clearly and be experiencing some mental health challenges. It is my responsibility to refer them to a mental health professional. Excellent. Excellent. So we're very clear about our boundaries and what we're able to do as a clergy and what I'm not able to do. And so with that being said, and you can share as much as you want or as little as you want, being a female in a male dominant, you know, religion in general, being a leader in a religious sector denomination is very male dominated um, mm -hmm. across the board. So being not only a female earning your ranks as a rabbi, mm -hmm. which I'd like to know a little bit more, even how to become a rabbi, mm -hmm. and then also having a hearing impairment that right. going through these channels, right. what has your experience been like? Well, 
I first want to offer a teaching for you. Thank you. We, we don't use the word hearing impairment. Okay. Because I'm not impaired. Okay, thank but, you. And so um, it's important to recognize all of us in what we call experimental in, in God's image. Yeah. So I am whole, no matter if my ears are broken or what. So, um, so it's interesting the way you presented what it's like to be a female in a male dominant um, career. But I have to tell you this. Women have been in the rabbinate for 50 years now. Okay. We're, we are approaching the 50th anniversary this year. And there's over 800 of us in the country and in Canada and um, in Europe and Israel. So it's not, um, it's not unusual. And so um, more and more in the seminary, the elite, Sometimes there's more women than men in the classes. So I just, I, what I've experienced about being a woman in this field was much more of a challenge um, when I, um, when my children were little. Okay. Uh, and it's typical, I think, for many women in terms, oh, how do you balance your career yes. and your family life? Is, you know, and they're like, oh, you should go home and take care of your children or, you know, and then there is um, discrimination or the fact that there are a large number of clergy these days that may be single and they are being looked down. Oh, you're not married. So you should be able to work more hours in the office. It's just like in the corporate world. If they don't have a family, if there's this expectation or unforeseen, expectations that they have to work. So that is a sign of um, challenging mental health issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the other question about my deafness is, um, first of all, I don't know what it's like not to be deaf. So I can't. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Right. So um, but I have to say that technology has been a huge factor in my um, success, besides being who I am. You know, I mean, nowadays, if the congregants know how to reach me, you know, they can text me, they can call me through the relay operator, you know, a relay operator, the 24-7 service, so you can call and you will see on the screen um, an ASL interpreter, and the interpreter will repeat what the other person is saying. Oh, so okay. The release, but it's 24-7, it's, it's available, it's provided by the state and the country. Um, so do you have to have that, is there a phone number that we can advertise when we're playing this video or is there? Oh, sure, I can do that. Okay, yeah, perfect. I can, it's just, um, it's, it's just, sometimes it's easier to email me or text okay. me. And then, yeah, I'll do it, but I also um, uh, shift to maintain my balance in getting phone calls. We often um, direct people to call my office. My office manager will come to my information or let me know and then I will follow up with that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, but there is a phone number available. So that's that. But also on the other hand, what are the things I value in my um ministry is the fact that as we were talking about earlier, it's so important to be in face to face. Uh, that that's so much of what I do in my um, spiritual mission. Just to be in the presence of others, to acknowledge them because in our today's society, it's so easy to feel overlooked mm -hmm. and not seen. Right. And so people know that if they're, if they're having a challenge or an issue, I think it doesn't matter if I'm deaf or not. I think we all know that doing it over the phone or may not be, it's not the ideal situation. Right. We should come in for counseling. We should be there to listen to the yes. a safe, safe space. Oh, Rabbi. And I know I always default to that. Oh, Rebecca, you've honed in on something that's very integral to my belief system, mm -hmm. that human connection. For everyone, we have been working together in different various projects, spirituality panel, things along those lines. This is the first time we've met face to face in over a year. Right. And this is, I can feel the energy. And it's like, it's great talking. Don't get me wrong, talking on Zoom, you know, for you know many reasons. It takes away geographical boundaries, whole nine yards. 
but this you can't you can't you can't put a price i mean it's just it's phenomenal to pick up on the energy and to feel that human connection and i i truly believe and i agree with you just like much of urban yellow's thoughts is in order to for people to feel seen and heard, is that we need to create that space to where, you know, it's engaging and empathetic, not only listening and speaking, but also, you know, the energy, that human connection. And it's just like, and I could feel your energy is very calm and just like, yes. I mean, you know, it's also okay when we're in this space. It's okay if people don't want to talk. I can just sit. That's the other thing that's important to each other. I'm very comfortable on silence. I think a lot of people are not, and it's not because I'm deaf, it's just because, you know, you can just sit, shift, contemplate, to reflect, or shift, be. Yes, you're right, like in the last year, I've gotten better, and not trying to fill the silence with questions, or just feeling the awkwardness, but actually leaning into it, so you hold in on one of my I don't want to say deficit, just something I'm trying to like just sit in the silence. It's okay. You can't say that word that you said. I know. You need to get that out of the vocabulary. Thank you, because you know I'm really about the positive. Right, but also, <laughs> and yeah, I've been saying not, a lot of negative connotations. Right, you gotta get rid of that. No, there's no just saying it. The perfect thing. Thank Please. you. So take ownership of that. Thank you. I will, and that'll help set even my intentions today. So I really try to operate in a positive space and positive right, energy. Okay. It's not so positive, but when you say deficit, it's very um, it's like I'm measuring myself down. against something. And it's like we're all unique human beings, like snowflakes. Right. And it's like there's no deficit or better. It's not a comparison. Nope. It's not a right or wrong. Nope. You are who you are. That's correct. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I'm speaking of like even addiction recovery. You know, I, I really am a part of, um, a really, I facilitate smart recovery on Wednesday evenings, and that's one of their philosophies is that, you know, in their meeting, they don't open with a, a label, like, I'm an addict, or I did this, because they truly believe that you, that's a part of your identity. What? You know, it's like, that's behavior, it's maladaptive, you know, we got to fine tune some things to make it more a healthier lifestyle for yourself. <laughs> but it's like when you start to have those negative words or the negative connotations or identify with negative things, that can really, you know, uh, veil your perspective about yourself and your belief in yourself. You. Yes. You. Um, you know, it says something about label. Label is something, obviously, you know, it's like, I mean, in the disability world, you know, shit for good. I, I identify to someone who is deaf. There may be someone else who says, well, I'm hard of hearing. Or there may be someone else who um, or don't say anything. But I'm sure it's the same thing in the addiction recovery. Uh, it's, it's very individual. And, it is. But I understand. And even in, a, in my faith community, the choices that we make and what we do and what we don't do. I think that's a part of my mission because there are people who feel like perhaps they came from a community that was much more observant and they did more. And then they come to me and they say, you know what, I don't do this, I don't do that. I said, that's not what I'm looking for. You came here, welcome. We'll, we'll take you as where you are and who you are because there's the differences and the different movements that I was telling you earlier. And because we're the only congregation here in town, the only synagogue. Okay. And we, we've created a community. You need to come in with every bag you're carrying in. And we will make it a safe place for you. Or a sacred space. Oh. Now, see, I'm very intrigued now to learn more, uh, not only about Judaism, but sure. also the synagogue. Can I just come there? I'm very... Um, I'm sure other people that are maybe watching this are like, yeah, and it's just like, I'm like, oh, it's kind of like when you go to the gym for the first time, like, you don't know what to do, you don't walk in, you feel judged. And I'll talk a little bit about it. Yeah, uh, it's for spatial identification. We're going to wait for the blender to get done. <laughs> and I wanted to ask, so I want to come, is there certain days of the week, like newcomers can come check out, or do I reach out to you to find out Because more? we're just a small community. Yeah. It's good to um, reach out to me directly, okay. or to my office manager, and we can just say, did, did we get a good time to come, or, you know, so we can make arrangements. Okay, and so would I come in and say, like, on a Friday or Saturday, come to, is it called a service? It's a, it's a worship service. A worship service, and that would be okay, like, my first time to come Absolutely. in. 
Okay. Absolutely. I think if there is a number of people that are interested, it would probably be helpful to create that opportunity. Yeah. To just come with other people and we'll make it into a program or something. That would be great. So anyone that's interested in learning more about Judaism, you know, I will go with you for your first time, or if we can get a small group, please reach out to me, or you will see Rabbi DeBose's information that will come across the screen, and you can reach out to her directly, and then we could organize something, and she could connect with me to say, hey, I've had like four or five people interested, and that way we could do it together, or if you'd like to do it individually, whichever, but we want to we want everyone in the community to know that there is an avenue to a synagogue right here in McLean County, and you know, if it's just fear that's holding you back from finding out more information, We'll connect you. We'll do it together. Absolutely. I think it's important to be educated, to be informed about the different religions out there. And it's important to understand that we are not a Christian, it's not a Christian organization. And there may, I obviously, there are many people that are curious and want to learn more. I think it's really important to remember that in our faith, we recognize that Jesus was a Jewish leader at one point. But then he took on his own teaching and his followers, the gospel, they created Christianity. Whereas Judaism, we stayed behind and we went the other direction. So you will need to recognize the fact that in the Jewish faith, Jesus was a way in a whole world. We do not um, recognize him as the Messiah. And um, we, uh, we don't anticipate or wait for the arrival of the Messiah. Okay. Uh, but that's just a fundamental difference. Um, and it's a part of the experience that I've been having here in this community um, because there are many um, secrets in this community. And I, I want to do my best to inform people yeah. where we are and where others might be because there have been some individuals that come in and they're so intrigued into by, and then I say about the role of Jesus, and they start thinking, and then some of these people sometimes come back and they ask more questions. So, like I said, anyone is welcome to see what that might be or mean. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad that you offer that as a high because some people have that ingrained in their mind that, Absolutely. and that is very much part of the belief system. And, and it's, yeah, exactly. I, I respect that and to each his own. I, for one, don't have a strong belief in that regard, so I would definitely be open to checking out, because it sounds like all the other the tenets and the belief system, the, the vertebrae of Judaism really speaks to my vertebrae of what I'm practicing without spirituality. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to be like, we do have a lot of universal values. It's yeah. not so fine. Even right. Though, even though people may think it is, because we have a, we have a different language. We use Hebrew, the biblical language. So many of our prayers are chanted in Hebrew. But we have English as well in the worship service. We have um, our 12, well, one of the things that our children learn is learning how to write, how to read Hebrew because our prayers are in Hebrew. I think that's really cool. Right, right, but this is the language where, um, started in the land of Israel, and that's what the language that they speak as well in Israel. Okay. I have a lot to digest, lots of learning. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then yeah. circling back, not that I um, want to come back to the mental health services yes. and how that intersects with Judaism. It's extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk and discussion within my movement. And um, also, another thing, I don't want to go off, but the importance of diversity and inclusion and um, the fact that there are uh, points of information that there are also people of color that are part of it because there's a notion that the Jewish community and we're talking about privilege that we are all white but we are trying very hard to recognize that there are many um, people from different countries or from different backgrounds that are also a part of the Jewish faith so yes yeah, that's another area but yes yeah, that's the mental health very much so. It's deeply ingrained. We have books with specific prayers or resources to talk about the importance. I mean, there were times, there was a time like in medieval times, but they didn't understand, you know, um, the fact how people do suffer. And, um, but going forward, 
we recognize that people there have been a large number of people of the Jewish faith that have problems with alcohol and drugs. And um, we still need to keep working, um, um, especially for the police to be trained to identify what's happening and knowing what to do. But yes, we um just because we're Jewish doesn't mean that we are uh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's very much on the radar. Okay, so say, is there a certain um, even belief systems or philosophical basis for the counseling profession that um, Judaism aligns with? What I mean by that, is there a certain like, is there a preference like counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, or psychologists, or is it really just anyone that is an expert in their field? Oh, it's really anyone that's an expert in their field. The challenge is... Um, one thing we have to keep in mind, especially here, and I, I look at myself as an outsider and I want to be very respectful. You do know that there are a number, and we know on the committee, there are a number of wonderful um, mental health Christian based programs here, mm -hmm. which is for the obvious reason because we're just one synagogue and there are churches on every corner. So yeah. there's this notion that if people need counseling related to mental health, that the Christian base would be the most appropriate. Right. So I'm going to be very frank. We do not have a, a church based mental health service program here. That's why should I do know not to identify anyone. I know there have been several that actually went up to Chicago okay. and went to St. Louis because they wanted to be in a um, an environment surrounded by the same place. Okay. So we do not have that here. And I'm not suggesting we can figure something out because we're so small and we're individual compared to the majority right. of people here. It's it's so big huge. conglomerate that's established. Yeah. Just like, you know, analogy is there's established, you know, different cult set programs yeah. that a lot of people identify with, even like oh, yeah. the judicial, spiritual system, the whole yeah. nine yards. Yeah. But we do need room and space for some of these more niche or not so known that it's not necessarily niche, but it's like if it has become more well known and accepted, yeah. but there's a need across the board for everyone, human services to you know, really meet everyone's needs and, you know, Judaism is one of them in, in the council services. And then let's add another layer, you know, an individual that is deaf, you know, what is it? That uh, is another, um, from what I understand, there are very few, not here, obviously, not here, very few um, mental health programs here for deaf patients in the country. I know that I, some family, this is not true, it's based, this is just in general. Um, there are very few programs, but I do know that quite a few um, social workers who, who are deaf or no, or fully in an AFL that are in those fields. I don't know where they are at because I have not really looked for them, but I do know families throughout the country, they would have to fly them to Utah, wow. fly them to, you know, wow. or I, I can't, I don't know, I'm sure there are out there. Right. Um, so with that being said, and my brain's already clicking with creativity, um, so save someone's a practicing counselor here in McLean County. Yeah. Aside from getting, um, you know, proficient ASLs, how could they make it friendly for the deaf community to receive services where they feel seen and heard. Right, I see, I think it's called the Center of Human Living, Living Independent. Oh and yes, a myself. Yes, mm -hmm. that would probably be the first place I'd go. Okay. And, and I would suggest if there's a social worker or this professional that is proficient in the ASL, that they should look on them. And say, look, if you know of any um, individuals that are in need of counseling, um, just to let them know that they are proficient in a Okay, so let's say in perfect world, we have some, we have a handful of you know, therapists here in town or counselors, proficient ASL. See if they're not. What are some of the just general, you know, respectful mannerisms that a counselor can have? Like, 
face contact, like mouth, mm-hmm. talking slow. Shoot, sure. more than that. I mean, but that's culture. There's a culture. I mean, it will require, I mean, someone to study the history, to understand the dynamics, understand the nuances of being in the presence of someone else. We also have to understand that most deaf people are very independent and they they may have their own modes of communication okay. and they will tell you what works for them. Okay. Because I mean I'm a strong advocate. You gotta you, you can't assume just because someone does not speak because most deaf people do not speak like I do. That's the other thing. You can't compare what I'm able to do. Again, just because that person doesn't speak doesn't mean that he, they have a deficit. deficit. It means that person could be a lawyer or a CPA, but it does not do, uh, you do ASL at their native language and not spoken English. So every individual is unique. It's just a different communication method. Right. That's right. really all it is. It's not right. deficit, better or worse or anything. Right. And I think you make the humans, the human population generally to look at their language right. and their perception of language and like, right. okay, let's, let's, you know, be more cognizant of the meaning behind our words that we're using. Mm-hmm. And with that being said, I, it kind of goes right in line with my, I've been looking at the golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Right. And much to your spirit, I've heard a couple of words that are very much my, you know, by words are assumption, assumptive and unique and ask someone. And I feel like the golden rule itself is very assumptive. So how do I know, Rebecca, that you want to be treated the same way I do? So I think the golden rule is good intention, but I'm really, I'm back to, I agree with you that we're all unique individuals and try to, I know there's a lot of implicit bias from our socialization, but try to become aware of when you're interacting with different people that maybe are not, you know, from, in this example, someone that's deaf, don't assume that, you know, that they can't talk, they, you know, that they're, they need help or anything like that. Right. It's like, just ask the individual, like, hey, would you prefer just like, you know, if someone you know, identifies with the LGBTQ community, what, do you have a pronoun preference? It's like right. asking these respectful questions. And I think it's very important that some people feel that maybe it's disrespectful, but I think it's more disrespectful not to bring attention to that conversation than to assume. Well, I just think that in the mental health community, everybody has their own story. Yes. Their own luggage that they're taking with yeah. them. And I think it takes a lot of effort as being the counselor or what do you call it? The recovery um, coach. Coach. Have them take the lead, not the coach take the lead. But I would think that's one way, even though you have the tool. Question is, um, how do you use those tools? And I think again, every person is different. And I love your um, your saying about assumptions. Oh my gosh, that's probably for another time. We can do a part two. We can do that. And I would like to, you know, on a serious note, why don't we pick this conversation up when I have more awareness okay. and more understanding after I come visit. And then that way we can talk about my experience as a newcomer and then, you know, we'll go from there. That's a deal. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Okay. Well, thank you for listening to us. Yeah. Thank you for listening. And a very noisy coffee shop. (laughs) Well, we'll make it work, you know, and whatever you took, whatever value you took out of this, it's all timely and you're meant to take what you took. And if you missed anything, you got to come see us. (laughs) Have a great day. Thank you.